Contemporary history is, of course, a contradiction in terms. By definition, if it's contemporary, it can't be history. No record, is what of, no record of what is current can hope to achieve the detachment expected when writing about the past. Uh, memory proves dangerously unreliable. Impressions muddy the facts. A ready-made consensus in respect to the most crucial developments does not yet exist and access to the documentation on which later histories will be written uh, is still embargoed. So this book, Midnight's Descendants, will certainly be challenged, and no less certainly, it'll soon be superseded. I knew all this, but I wrote it nevertheless. I thought the book was needed. South Asians are already more numerous than Chinese, and they may soon rival them in the global marketplace. Over the last six decades, the region, has endured, the region has endured more wars than the Middle East. In the process, it has acquired two nuclear arsenals, plus a reputation for extreme volatility and appalling acts of terrorism. Yet studies of South Asia as a single entity scarcely exist. For those who live there, visa restrictions limit the cross-border the possibility of cross-border travel, and they inhibit mutual exchange, just as um, patriotism or prejudice inhibits mutual understanding. So the outsider has a slight advantage here, which is really my excuse for having undertaken the book. But what intrigued me more was how the components of South Asia, that's principally India, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka, have measured up to one another, how they relate to one another nowadays. At first glance, they don't. Elsewhere in the world, various uh, political unions, free trade associations, defense pacts, hegemonic doctrines like those Monroe, Brezhnev, and so on, and ideological alliances have lent some sort of coherence to the conduct of international relations. But in South Asia, a, a region where geography, history, culture, economic reciprocity, and infrastructural links all argue strongly in favor of the closest possible association, even modest attempts at cooperation seem to flounder. The subcontinent continues to be defined not in terms of shared interests, but of past traumas, of contested loyalties, and of irreconcilable ambitions. Encouraged by governments of every hue, national identities still owe everything to the awareness of a hostile other just across the border. This um, othering even dictates national psyches. Each nation state seems to present a political profile specifically designed to challenge that of its neighbor. So the Republic of India is a wildly non-denominational, democratic, internationally respected, and is recently regarded as an, international, as an economic success. Pakistan and Bangladesh, on the other hand, are confessionally Islamic, susceptible to military rule, internationally disparaged, and economically struggling. Partition did not just divide most of the region. It launched the successor states of British India on diametrically opposed trajectories. So much so that to this day, South Asians tend to prioritize the tragedy of partition over the triumph of independence. The second half of the 20th century is remembered not as the post-independence era, but as the post-partition era. The euphoria of emancipation has been eclipsed by the horror of division. The scale of that horror has undoubtedly been exaggerated, though to say so is in no way to, to diminish the horror itself. As many as half a million South Asians, for as many as half a million South Asians, a partition brought death at the hands of their former countrymen. For 15 million others, mostly in the Punjab and the Northwest, it meant immediate displacement. And for perhaps another 15 million, mostly in Bengal and the Northeast, it meant subsequent, later displacement. Arguably, this latter process is still incomplete with pop with population movements across what is now the Bangladesh-India border being responsible for the still chronic instability in the northeast of the subcontinent. Now, let me explain a bit by reading you 
uh, a short section from uh, the book's introduction. It was, I should explain, it was informed by um, a visit in 2009 to the Sundarbans. That's the swampy region south of Calcutta, Calcutta, where the Ganges and the Brahmaputra rivers feed into the largest estuarine wilderness in the world. Dividing the subcontinent had itself been a compromise and proved a heavy price to pay for independence. Flying in the face of 50 years' struggle for a single independent India and in the face of a shared cultural and historical awareness that stretched back centuries, it had been dictated by three recent developments. Most Indian Muslims had come round to the idea of a Muslim homeland of their own. Most Indian nationalists were insisting on a successor state that was strong enough to resist such demands, and the British were desperate for a fast-track exit. Adopted only as a last-minute expedient, partition was widely regretted at the time, and by all who hold life, livelihood, and peace to be dear, it has been rude ever since. These people here must be Indian then, I venture. Fishing boats and a gaggle of school children hint at a nearby village, but there's no mains electricity, no road, and no phone line. And all this despite being within 150 kilometers of downtown Calcutta. Well, yes, now they're mostly Indian, but many of them are actually from Bangladesh, some Hindu, some Muslim. In the Sundarbans, the rivers and the raptors are not the only changeable things. Decades after British-ruled India was partitioned into the republics of India, Pakistan, and later Bangladesh, national identities in this part of the subcontinent remain as fluid as the wind-ruffled soup that passes for water. So too do patterns of migration and the terminology applied to them. Immediately after the Great Partition of 1947, people who crossed the border were known as refugees. In the 1960s, they became evacuees. In the 1970s, either austies or optees. And in the 1980s, illegal immigrants and now potential terrorists. Just like the reception afforded them in their chosen destination, their status has been declining. Not though their numbers. The exodus into India from that part of Pakistan, which in 1971 became Bangladesh, has always been difficult to quantify. Some say hundreds of thousands across the border, some say millions. Urban India's 21st century construction boom draws heavily on Bangladeshi labor, much of it illegal. Locally, there are migrants who traipse back and forth for seasonal work or even a daily wage. No one is sure who is a migrant worker and who a cross-border commuter. Throughout the Delta, people still come and go, largely undetected like the tides and the tigers. A thousand kilometers to the north, where the Bangladesh border squeezes the Indian state of West Bengal up against the Himalayas, the situation is further complicated by what must be the most eccentric frontier confirmation in, on Earth. Here, territorial logic veers to the opposite extreme, that of over-definition. Communities lie trapped in time-warped pockets their national identity determined by arcane landholding patterns and the inflexible notions of sovereignty so jealously guarded by modern nation states. With little regard to the religious affinities of the inhabitants, partition here simply appropriated the piecemeal patterns of cultivation and proprietorship found in the extant land registers and then upgraded them into international borders. All this is in uh, striking contrast to India's nearby border with Nepal, of course, uh, which is unpoliced and open, or India's border with Pakistan, which, of course, is heavily militarized and closed. Yet crossing any of these borders to a foreigner occasions no great cultural shock. To the outsider, most South Asians, whatever their nationality, still look quite alike. They often wear loose, baggy clothes, uh, and they travel with far too much luggage. They're particular about diet, their languages are sometimes mutually comprehensible, and they enjoy the same movies and music. Nearly all engage in some form of devotional activity, nearly all marry within approved circles, and nearly all take pride in their familial, their family, their community, and their regional identity. Crossing from India's West Bengal into Bangladesh, you might not realize you'd change countries. The differences between one country and another are often less obvious 
than those between adjacent states in Europe. Non-Islamic India is home to nearly as many Muslims as either Pakistan or Bangladesh. Despite its growing affluence, it also has more of the malnourished, the unlettered, and the socially deprived than Pakistan and Bangladesh combined. Persistent orderly hunger, as one economist has called it, is one of the region's shared and all too enduring characteristics. So is a confidence born of a deep and incredibly rich matrix of traditional beliefs and devotional practices. Lord Ganesh, the elephant-headed god, occupies a place in almost every boardroom. Waqfs, Waqfs, Islamic property portfolios, are quoted on the Karachi Stock Exchange. Astrologers advise politicians about when to call an election. Even the constitutional tags are not, diametrically, are not as diametrically opposed as they seem. Once in power, democratically elect elected leaders have often turned into autocrats. Have often turned into autocrats. Remember Mrs. Gandhi's emergency in the 1970s? And autocrats have often sought popular endorsement. Remember, remember Ayub Khan's experiment in what he called basic democracy in the 1950s. Military coups have often proved less bloody than elections, and avowedly secular regimes have harbored as much fanaticism and discrimination as avowedly sectarian ones. Despite partition and all that has followed, South Asians have a lot more in common than they care to admit. Indeed, partition itself rates as a shared experience and one from whose fallout the region seems fated to suffer indefinitely. Now, what will follow, I have absolutely no idea. The central premise of this book is that South Asia must be understood as a whole, as an entity, which, however discordant, shares a present and a future just as surely as it shares an interminable past. For as a defining event, partition did not just fracture the subcontinent, it restored, in fact, that political plurality that had characterized most of South Asia's pre-colonial history. In other words, history was actually on the side of partition, not against it. And it also bequeathed to South Asia a shared legacy of hostility and carnage, yes, but also of mass migration. Partition loosened the bonds of caste and community to flood the cities, Karachi, Delhi, Kolkata, Mumbai, and so on, with immigrants, and then to launch a wave of emigrants to Europe and North America, followed by the Gulf and the rest of the world. Coincidentally, at a time when South Asians were rejecting political integration, the integration that the British had achieved, China was busy reasserting its historical integrity. In the 1950s, Manchuria, then Xinjiang, Tibet were quickly reclaimed by the People's Republic. Taiwan's defection was vigorously contested, and the British in Hong Kong were given notice to quit. A recently fragmented China was unifying, just when a recently unified India was fragmenting. Mainland East, A Mainland East Asia then turned in on itself for three decades. Mainland South Asia began to engage with the wider world. All that we can say for sure is that this engagement will continue. Partition's descendants, Midnight's children, and now it's grandchildren and great-grandchildren I was actually going to call this book Midnight's Grandchildren, but then someone said there was a book with a very similar title, so I had to change it. Midnight's children and now its grandchildren and great children have merely to embrace one another with some of the enthusiasm that they have embraced our flawed but globally interactive world.